Okay, it's a Thursday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and I'm going to be the guest host today. And Ethan Allen is going to be the host guest. Did I get that right, Ethan? <laughs> yes, indeed, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Likeable Science, and uh, welcome to your show, Ethan. Let's talk <laughs> about COVID because that's what, you know, it just drives us, it compels us. Um, you know, people who may have shows about rosebuds, they wind up talking about COVID. And, and we need to do that because we're talking about science. And there's two areas that we should cover. You know, one is the articles that have appeared about a collaboration between Google and Apple. They were going to make, a, um, you know, a, a, a tracking a tracking software for your smartphone and app. Um, and this was going to be able to, um, you know, find out if you were near anybody who had. Can you briefly describe how that how that's supposed to work? Sure. So the, the idea is that while well, all your phones have GPS in them, that's, GPS is not incredibly precise about exactly how, how, how it locates you. But your little Bluetooth uh, applications, these very weak radio signals that only travel a few hundred feet, can help really localize how close you are to other Bluetooth devices. So the idea is that if, if you have an app running in the background, it's always sort of sending out pinging other Bluetooth devices <clears throat> and you upload that data uh, and uh, <clears throat> the other people, the other owners of the other Bluetooth devices, the other smartphones can be notified that they've been in contact and are at risk. Um, now there's a whole bunch of different issues. What, what kind of contact constitutes at risk? If you're around a person for 15 seconds, does that mean you're at risk? Uh, how does the phone know if you, you may be there for a long time, but you might be separated by a wall or a window and therefore or a floor. Not, or a yes. floor. Right. So it's a, there are a huge number of unknowns uh, about this. <clears throat> and we really, <clears throat> sorry, we, we really don't know too much about how many virus particles you need to inhale over what period of time to put yourself at risk. I and mean, viruses are incredibly pervasive. We live in a sea of viruses. Every day on this planet, every square yard of the planet, it rained down about 875 million viruses on that. So, we, I mean, we're, we're always breathing in viruses uh, day in, day out. It's just this particular one is not very good for us, you know? Yeah, well, okay, you know, but the big, the big thing about this app is that, um, in order to be effective, it's got to know who's who's uh, who's got the disease, <clears throat> and the problem with that is you you got to tell it, or somebody has to tell it. Um, <clears throat> now, if if you tell it yourself on a voluntary basis, that's imperfect to develop an app like this because some people are reluctant to tell them on a voluntary basis. So you have imperfect uh, spotty data. Um, <clears throat> now, if you make the government a repository of that information, who that's Uji. Uh, the, you don't want the government to do that. I mean, a lot of people would oppose it. Even if you and I agreed it was an important government function, uh, we would also agree that leadership should not be trusted, especially now. Uh, and, and, and furthermore, there would be people who would oppose it in any event. It's a conceptual matter. They don't want government to know who's got, who's got the virus. Uh, even though there's a good public policy to, you know, to, to, to have government know and to have maybe some trusted institution in the country, no. But this whole system is not gonna work if privacy prevails technology. Um, people have got to be agreeable to allowing the system to know who's infected. Um, and that's the problem. And that's why I think they, they ran into trouble. They announced this collaboration, oh, it must be six weeks ago already. Time goes by and you haven't seen more on it except the fact that everybody's raising the privacy issue. Ethan, do you think anybody, you know, think it's going to go anywhere here? And so far, it may be good on a technical level, but it's still got to, it's got to work, you know, as it's, it's deployed. Right. And there are, there are big issues and nobody really knows that there are models about how much of the population has to have such an app and use such an app before it becomes effective. If only one or two percent of the population have the app and use it, it's probably not going to do any good really for anyone. If 95% of your population has the app and uses it, it's going to be great. I mean, you're really yeah. going to catch a lot of cases. Yeah. Neither of those extremes is likely to happen. Not here in this yeah. country. As a culture right. point, it has happened in, in, uh, in China, say, for instance. China, yeah, they, right? They make they, you do it. And Korea also has a tracking app. 
Uh, right. So in that case, it, it's one of many tools, but it is it is being deployed effectively. Uh, and you know that if you have all the pieces working, um, it can be very useful in fighting oh, COVID or any other virus. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it can, I gather in China, it's hooked up to a, basically a health card that you also have on your phone that basically will change color and basically alert others that, you know, you, you shouldn't, <laughs> you, you can't come in here, your card has turned red because you've gotten, you know, you're, we expect you're exposed and shedding virus now. But yeah, yeah. it's, it's uh, Australia is using it. It's pretty, it's pretty popular there. Uh, people there apparently trust their government pretty well. Uh, they're already talking about reopening Australia and New Zealand trade and, and travel pretty easily and even maybe including some of the small Pacific Island nations where, again, because of their isolation, they haven't really had much COVID problem. So, um, but well, I, I predict that in the future, we're going to see more of this. It's inevitable. And, oh, yeah, I think uh, we're going to see waves. And the technology and, um, you know, the need to know, the need to do the demographic and is going to prevail over privacy considerations. We've seen that in, in so many other contexts. One kissing cousin on this app is the app they've been talking about for tourism in Waikiki uh, to enforce uh, quarantine for Tourists, uh, for example, they have no way to enforce that now. We're going to have a, an armed guard stand at the guy's door while he spends, you know. Um, so we got to know where the tourist is. We have to track his movements. This is not hard, and it's not really all that invasive for a tourist. Who cares? He doesn't care if you know where he is, I guess, mostly. <laughs> it depends what he's doing, doesn't it? Um, but it would be sort of like um, one of those uh, bracelets that you wear if you're if you're right. being watched by, say, a criminal authority, um, right. and you can't get it off, and it always feeds back. Now, this is, we don't do bracelets, but uh, we can do this on, on your smartphone. Um, and if you turn your smartphone off, it can still work. We know that smartphones mm -hmm. work even when they're off. And even if you got around that, um, the authorities could require you to call in at a certain mm -hmm. interval uh, so that right. they can feel confident that you're in the right place. Have you heard anything about you know, the possibility of this being rolled out here in Hawaii? I, I haven't really, but the point was made a while ago that if we really want Hawaii to thrive, Hawaii has to be seen as, as a safe destination. And if we want to do that, we have to, as you point out, do something, have some system in place where we can basically ensure visitors that they are relatively safe from uh, any such disease. And it's going to take something like that that visitors basically here will have to sort of sign a waiver and say, yes, I agree to have this uploaded on my phone. I know it's going to track me wherever I go, you know, and uh, I presume it, it would be linked to some sort of a, a same kind of thing as we were talking with the, the Google Apple. Thing, well, that's a of... very good point. I mean, it, it can be used to determine whether the person is abiding by quarantine, <clears throat> except I don't think quarantine is going to last that much longer, is it? So then you say, well, we want to know where he is, but we only know if he's near anybody who's, uh, who's contagious or anybody who's not contagious is near him. When we find he is contagious, <clears throat> that requires everyone in the state or at least a, a, you know, a number of people, the herd, so to speak, right. in the state to have uh, comparable uh, apps on their phones. And, and then you right. get back into the privacy issue. <clears throat> then you get back to this entity between tourists and uh, local people where they don't want to cooperate, they don't care about tourists kind of thing. You, so you'd have to do some selling to get local people to buy into an app that could turn into, um, you know, the yeah. kind of tracking app that Google and Apple have been considering. Right. Yeah. And, you know, again, there's a good deal of debate in the, in the world and, and a lot of models that are being done about how much of the population really has to be start using that. But it looks like roughly if roughly half of the cell phone users put such an app on their phone, it would probably begin to have some significant impacts on, on the spread. You could, if it's, you know, if there's some follow-up to it, if there, there is contact tracking yeah, and, yeah. and tracing. One, one way you could actually um, encourage people to put the app on the phone is to go further than just tracking. You could use it uh, for developing data. Um, mm -hmm. and that's really important. You know, how many people are in touch with other people who may have the disease or do have the disease? And then you could, uh, you could build a model, so to speak, of the demographics, which takes us to our second kind of technology that we want to talk to about today. You sent me a very interesting article um, by the RAND blog, which I guess is related to the RAND Corporation, it's a think tank. 
Um, right. And it talks about the different kinds of demographic models that we have going now, some more successful than others, um, some based on uh, data, uh, some based on you know, conceptual considerations, and some based on a, a variety of factors, including current events that happened this morning in order to develop models. Can you talk about it? Well, the, there, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, if you look sort of globally, you see the, the demographic trends that make such a difference. That is, it was predicted that, that by this time there would be huge COVID spikes in places where there are people very densely packed into, into urban areas and the healthcare systems are not good, such as parts of India and Bangladesh. It simply hasn't come to pass. The people there that packed into these places, the healthcare systems are not ready, but they really have not had very bad outbreak. Their numbers of cases are minuscule compared to the US. And it's largely because of demographics, because those countries are young countries. Most of their population is centered in kids, teenagers, or young adults with a relatively small percentage of older people. Um, and that, that's a huge, a huge factor uh, as to how badly you're impacted. Yeah, well, you know, I think what, what's interesting to me is that um, all of these have a certain subjective quality because you have to make choices, you have to make assumptions. In the case of, uh, even in the case of the, the flat out dollars and cents kind of metric uh, data statistics that go into most models, uh, you have to make choices about what data you're using and how mm -hmm. you're getting it. And there, you know, there are vagaries there. Um, but I suppose you could say for those, it's based on actual um, data. And presumably there are scientific standards that allow you to collect the best data. Although I think those are evolving right now. So that right. one is probably the more, you know, rational, more reliable, if you understand the assumptions. Um, the one that's conceptual is that's much more subjective. And the one, the one that depends on current events that happen and feed a variety of uh, variables in based on what's happened lately, uh, that's very subjective. And so um, query, you know, what kind of um, what kind of reliability should we put on these things? I mean, uh, was it, I think it was the, um, the state of, uh, oh yeah, it was Columbia University correctly predicted that we'd have over 100,000 deaths already. God, every time I say that number, it kills me because I don't, I don't think the White House understands what 100,000 deaths means. Um, right. it's, it's just overwhelming, overwhelming. And I, every time we mention that number, I want to tell people it's overwhelming. It's incredible. No. Um, anyway, so I think Colum the Columbia model predicted that the Washington model, which is, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, the Columbia model was a backward model. There's two kinds there too, backward and forward. The Columbia model said that if you had behaved better, if you had used a better system mm -hmm. uh, two or three weeks ago, we would have saved 30,000 30, lives. Right, that's, right. What, that's Columbia. Um, right. The Washington model was different. That was looking forward, and they predicted something like seventy thousand deaths. They were off. That, mm -hmm. that was not accurate, really. Uh, Thirty thousand right. deaths is a lot of deaths. Um, and and then, of course, there's various other models. So, I guess you know what I'm saying is, there's competing models. I don't know if the government is funding any of these or participating or even giving data. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they're getting data from the states because Trump has left it to the states to. to you know, to stumble around on this. Um, so uh, query whether any of them is useful, uh, at least to establish um, A, uh, whether we would have saved more lives looking backward or B, how many lives we're gonna lose going forward. What's your level of confidence in this kind of model? Uh, I mean, as you say, they're, they're evolving. Uh, the models are evolving, some, some have proven uh, shockingly inaccurate. Um, uh, I was just speaking of some of those about how, how the virus would behave in, in, in some urban centers in the uh, developing countries. But it, it's, it's also important, to, you, you were talking at the one about the model that takes into account current factors. I mean, that's, that's what you, you sort of got to realize there's a fundamental biology here, right? Somebody, somebody who has this virus sneezes and they've expelled suddenly tens of millions of viral particles in a stream, a cloud, a fairly dense cloud. 
that goes out 10 or 15 feet away from them and starts diffusing. And again, depending on how the wind is, if it's very still air, that cloud may sort of hang there for a while and gradually settle down. Uh, if there's wind, it starts carrying it, but again, it gets more and more dispersed all the time. Then when you run into that cloud and how dispersed that cloud is, you know, means you may inhale a few viruses, which probably doesn't do you any harm or 10,000 viruses, which your body probably can deal with. But if you happen to sort of hit the wrong part of that cloud, right, uh, hit a swirl or an eddy where, where it's, it's particularly dense, you know, you may inhale a million viruses, which may be enough to really start a whole case for you. So th there, there is this huge sort of, it's not exactly random, but, but, but it's a very hard to know element about, about the, the, the virus yeah, and its spread. Yeah, so the idea is to connect the model or the sub-model as the case may be, um, to that phenomenon right. um, and protect you. I mean, I think where there's two levels of policy which uh, should be, should take into account the results and recommendations of these various models that we, that are evolving. Uh, one, one is the government. So mm -hmm. if the government finds, um, and, and I suppose uh, you, you have to look at it area by area because if, if you find that the meatpacking plant across the street uh, has uh, you know a substantial percentage of infections. Um, that is instructive on w whether you should open or close the economy and how, how you should conduct um, you know the law uh, and, and the uh, proclamations, as it were, in that area, I suppose, or in like areas, which may not be in that little town or city. It may be across the state border. So the federal government always has a role here. Nobody can tell me that the federal government can stand back and do nothing. Right. Um, no, it's got to instruct the federal government as to like situations in other areas in terms of determining policy. Uh, exactly. The federal government done a terrible job. I want to say that too. You know, just, just like just like the point of what does a hundred thousand deaths mean? I think hmm. it has to be emphasized that the federal government has done a terrible job. There's no issue about it. Um, anyway, so that one thing is what public policy means um, in terms of federal action, state action, coordinate action and so forth. The other is personal. It's personal. It's my policy. Um, you know, for example, you know, I have to decide uh, whether to go to a senior facility. This is a gross example. Whether to go to a senior facility because I can't uh, handle things anymore. Um, I'm not going to do that now. Uh, the information is so clear. Um, and, and so there are a lot of examples like that about where you live, what you do, how careful you are uh, in a given community. Uh, if, if it is determined in a model that masks are very helpful or if they have been helpful in this community in these circumstances, that's information, that's advice and counseling to me on how I conduct my life. So I need right. to hear, I need to hear advice from these model people too. Right, so it, it's, uh, as you say, I think the government needs to be basing its policies on evidence, you know, and which our government currently does not seem very strong on looking at evidence or wanting to pay any attention to it, but that's the only rational way to handle this. But each individual too should have that same attitude. So the comparison has been made uh, during London and World War II, the blackouts they did, you know, they enforced people that said, you know, got to pull down, have blackout curtains, blah, blah, blah. Anyone who, did, who violated that blackout, it wasn't just, you know, hey, you know, you can't tell me I, I have to pull my shade down because their shade being up in danger, not only themselves, but all their neighbors, right? And people who ignore good public health advice about social distancing and all that are essentially doing the same thing. They're not just endangering themselves, they're endangering everyone around them. And, and it's, it, there's a real piece of, of social responsibility that has to be emphasized here. That we, we, all, we all are, like it or not, in this together. And we all have to work together to, to, to get it treated, you know, to get it dealt with. Yeah, we have to deal with it together. They understand that in Korea, Japan, China, that you Absolutely. have to work together. And I, I find it remarkable in this country that we don't understand that. Uh, even if you disagree with the policy, you, you know, you have to agree with the morality of saving your neighbor. Uh, I, I find it extraordinary that people reject that completely and go out. Um, you know, the, the national the national concert on Sunday, they're all sitting there, thousands of them, no masks, shoulder to shoulder, spreading virus. I mean, unbelievable. And the government is directly involved in this. Wait till you see the parade on July 4th. It's going to be the same thing in Washington. It's ignoring the science. Uh, 
and, and it, more than failing to establish a policy that coordinates these efforts, frankly, in my opinion, there ought to be serious sanctions if you endanger your neighbor. Uh, by the way, oblique to that point, I'd like your thought about it. There are a lot of people using technology against um, saving your neighbor. Uh, they're scamming, they're selling faulty mm -hmm. PPE, um, mm -hmm. they're taking advantage of the situation, uh, they're, you know, charging too much money and providing ineffective equipment, what have you, a million things like that, and, and they're getting away with it. Now, if, if, if I was the government uh, on that one, uh, those people are jeopardizing everyone else, and uh, I would put them in the clink for a long time. Um, uh, because because if you endanger multiple people, as you say in the blackout, it's much more significant than just endangering yourself. I think we have failed to uh, to make laws that enforce the notion of protecting your neighbor, and a lot of people don't care about protecting their neighbor. The people who went into the Michigan uh, State House uh, a couple, well, just a week ago, yeah. Extraordinary how, how irresponsible and how inconsiderate they are of the health of their neighbors and the community. And exactly. that's not only in Michigan, it's all around the country. Right. And you know, as a country, we have this very strong history and streak of individualism. And we're all able to go off and do what we want to do and be who we want to be, right? The Wild West sort of mm -hmm. mentality. And unfortunately, that does typically sort of then ignore uh, the, the sense of community and res responsibility to, to a community that, that we in this country tend to, to lack or have in very low dose compared to a lot of other places. Uh, in the Pacific Islands, where I did, did some work some years ago, very, very strong sense of community where you would set aside, people would set aside their own goals and aspirations because they understood they had obligations to their family, their friends, their, their community. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge, a huge thing. And as you say, we need somehow to build a better sense of that in this country, and whether it's through laws to enforce it or uh, incentives to encourage it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Which well, maybe maybe both, but, but it starts with leadership and we don't have that here. And we have right. divisiveness instead of leadership. Absolutely. So the two things we've talked about today in this show primarily is uh, one is the, um, uh, you know, the idea of having an effective app and um, that, that has uh, obstacles uh, by virtue of the, the divisiveness over the issue of privacy and the divisiveness as to whether to, to take it, to use it, uh, to um, you know, actually take advantage of the technology, and that and that's a failure of uh, community. It's a failure of leadership because obviously it would help us. Uh, right. But I think I think it's clear that people are not going to do it in the way um, that it needs to be done. And the second the second thing is is, is a similar um, common denominator uh, that in the in the case of public policy based on evidence. In the case of public policy, based on these models, as they evolve and get better and better, you have to listen to them. You have to develop public policy. You have to implement public policy. You have to get people to go along with the public policy you, you, know, you initiate. And we don't have that. Everybody going its own individualistic way. Uh, so the problem is that technology has a real barrier in these United States at this moment in time of being an effective way to deal uh, with COVID. What do you think about that? Yeah, and this, this actually gets into a, a sort of a related area of the, the uncertainties uh, around, say, issues like climate change. There, well, the general phenomenon is well known, well accepted by virtually every single scientist who's bothered to take a look at it. There are a lot of uncertainties, unknowns that the, the, there's all kinds of interesting models based some on historical data, some on projected trends, some on theoretical considerations. And yeah, uh, some are going to prove to be more accurate than others over time, but that's that's sort of part and parcel of science. You know, science isn't all about the knowns. It's, it's all about the unknowns and, and getting, you know, it's not about finding the truth. It's about sort of getting closer to the truth. Uh, and that's fundamentally what the same thing is about. There's so much unknown about uh, this virus and how it spreads and how it behaves that all we can do is sort of keep tacking back and forth, gradually moving closer and closer to some truth, some accurate policy on it, and 
that's that's going to mean the policies are going to change and evolve and advice that seemed like it was sound at one point is now going to be seen as outdated and unsound that that happens you know and people should accept that i think we've done a poor job of having people understand that's the way science works um and uh we need to do that as you say and, and, it, and it takes leadership from the top basically admit that up front that, that we've got a lot that we don't know here we've got a, a potentially dangerous situation and we should you know, err on the side of caution until we uh, know more about it. Yeah, well, I think it's a really good point. People have to understand the scientific process. It's not so much as, uh, you know, a, a rule of science that you must follow. It's understanding the process, reaching the right. truth, finding right. the statue in the marble, so to speak. It's there, and we all have to work together to support our, our, our science. Um, and and the, the problem we have now today, which is, you know, beyond what the experience might have been, is that we have misinformation and disinformation coming from the top, uh, confusing about the science, giving us bad science, you know, that are not, these, the, the information advice counseling we get from the top is contrary to science. And so this creates a confusion, a consternation, and it becomes that much more difficult to, con to convince people about the essential quality of science and how you do science and how you implement science and how you base public policy on science. So right yeah. now it's a morass, I would say. Right, and, and that's, to me that, that is, that's, that's appalling that uh, our government leaders are in some sense sowing, sowing seeds of mistrust in science. Science is not perfect. Science is a human institution like all others. There are good scientists, there are bad scientists, there are scientists who are selfless and will go the extra mile to be sure everything is good. There are people, other people who employ science for their own per personal and selfish gains. But science as a whole has a self-correcting process that does, as I say, it doesn't find the truth, but it brings us ever closer to the truth by its, its nature. And to blatantly ignore that and as you say, so misinformation and disinformation costs lives, it, it, it makes, it divides the, the, the people and then, yeah, it, 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 in some sense, it undermines the scientific process, you know, so it, it, it's appalling. Yes. yes, it does. And, and, that, and, and, that, and that goes in other areas, not just in COVID. So, you know, maybe we'll learn, but we haven't learned so far. As a matter of fact, I would even venture to say we are, we are worse off now than we were when we started this game. Um, we respect science. We are receiving more dis disinformation uh, than before. And, and we want to have to learn the hard way. Um, and and I, this is very troubling. And I hope that uh, we find other ways to deal with it. But I think the reality is before we understand we're responsible for our neighbor, before we understand about science and the process, before we understand about basic policy um, and, and personal decisions on good science, uh, we're going to suffer a lot more. Um, so we have to listen to good scientists like you, Ethan. Ethan's a scientist, <laughs> in order to do that. But it's a long way. It's a long way home, and it's a test of humanity, isn't it? It's a test yeah. of the humanity on the planet. And there are, I mean, there are lots of good scientists doing it. Anthony Fauci is it's an amazing guy who's gone huge, gone the extra mile to really help provide good information. Uh, and some government leaders, uh, Andrew Cuomo, springs to mind. Listen to people like Fauci, follow that advice, uh, base their decisions on, on the best available science and really help make the situation better. Uh, uh, that's not always true, unfortunately, but yeah. You know. Well, we have to look overseas too. There's some very effective leaders overseas in Asia and New Zealand, Australia, for example, Korea, yes. Japan, even Taiwan. <clears throat> Those places are dealing with it better than we are. And uh, maybe we should learn that the world is indeed flat. It is indeed global. Uh, America was might have been exceptional some time ago, but it is it's not exceptional now. Uh, and we have our problems um, internally and externally. And we and we should we should watch what happens elsewhere and respect it. Um, yeah, that that may help from us that. save ourselves. Yeah. Right. Please. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ethan Allen, uh, <clears throat> scientist. Uh, par, uh, sci uh, our excellent scientists. <laughs> I hope we can do this again very soon, Ethan. There's more to come, you know. Every day is a bunch of surprises. It's, it's always new fun stuff to talk about with science, Jerry. I'm always Thank happy you. to do it. Thank you, Ethan. Aloha. All right. All right. Aloha. Safe.